following program on Ada Verna 24 is classified for general audience. It is intended for all ages. It contains little or no violence, no strong language, and little or no sexual dialogue or situations. We would like to remind our viewers that the views expressed in this program by our participating guests are solely viewpoints of them who take part and does not reflect the views and beliefs of the Verena Media Network. Good evening and you're joining us on another episode on Gen XYZ. As you all know, this is a platform where we talk about youth-related topics or issues. Now, today on the program, we are going to talk about a disease that has been spreading and it's a very well-known disease to everybody and that is dengue. We are not going to talk about the basics of dengue because I'm pretty sure that all of us know that it is coming from mosquitoes and how what ne we need to do in order to prevent it from our homes and in our workplace and we have repellents to do so. But today on the show, we are going to talk about questions that people have been asking constantly but have not been answered per se. So to talk about this, I would like you to be introduced to Dr. Ananda Vikrama, who is the senior consultant and physician of the National Institute of Infectious Diseases. Dr. Ananda, thank, thank you so much yeah, for thanks. taking the time to join me on the show today. And I'm sorry that I had to take some valuable time of yours and you've been busy with your patients as well. And I appreciate that a lot. Now, uh, Dr. Ananda, to start off our discussion, we all know what dengue is, but the problem is now there are three types of diseases, which is dengue, malaria and Zika. All three diseases have been uh, causing by mosquitoes. So, but what exactly is the severe disease and what are the differences of it? Well, basically, when you take those three diseases, the common thing, as you said, uh, in those three illnesses is that uh, all uh, three are spread by the, uh, a mosquito, a type of mosquito. However, uh, fortunately, at present, we do not have malaria and dengue in Sri Lanka. We, uh, malaria and uh, rather, malaria and Sika in Sri Lanka. Right? Uh, we see some patients occasionally uh, with malaria, but they are at the moment people who have come from other countries where, where malaria is prevalent, like uh, some African countries, or maybe even from India, pa some parts of India. Uh, but uh, in Sri Lanka, it is not there at the moment. Uh, when it comes to Sika also, it is uh, not present in Sri Lanka. Uh, however, the, the Sika also is spreaded by the same mosquito which spreads dengue. But malaria is uh, spread by a different uh, mosquito which is called Anopheles. Uh, so, uh, it's quite different. So, at the moment, we see a lot of dengue patients. Dengue had been uh, all over the country more or less since uh, 2009 and each year we see more than 25,000 cases happening and this year the numbers are going up uh, probably to much higher levels. That's right doctor, that's something which we need to talk about because the infections, uh, the number of infections have been increasing throughout the years. So. Can't we do anything to reduce that number? Definitely we can. Actually we should. Uh, because this year already we have got four, more than 40,000 cases by now. From 1st of uh, January this year. So, and, and it's going to be much more, most, more likely during the course of next month or so. Because generally it's with monsoon rains the numbers uh, go up. Uh, and we are expecting monsoon rains next month and the month after. So it is likely that we will see more and more cases during the, uh, the next two months. So we have to do everything possible to spread, minimize the spread of the illness. That's right, doctor. But the thing is now, we have been having a number of infections throughout the past years per se. But then, as you said, the numbers have not been decreasing. So. What can we do? Like, isn't the awareness enough for people to prevent themselves from getting dengue? Or what is the country doing? Are we doing something wrong here? Uh, well, obviously we are not doing enough. That's why the numbers are high. Right? That's, uh, I, I believe that would be obvious for anybody. Uh, and we have learned a lot also. Now, in 2017, we had the largest outbreak uh, where we had uh, 186,000 patients in that year. 
and uh, during that outbreak we learned a lot about the prevention the the cause of the illness and many things we had a lot of experience and we had to use this experience so we need to have at present in the present context we need to have some immediate plans to immediately cut down the uh, spread and then we have to have medium and long term plans to minimize the spread we may not be able to totally eradicate it uh, but we should be able to reduce it and that has to be a uh, action taken together by individuals institutions both government and uh, uh, private and then the government because a lot of policies are uh, needed to be changed and address this and we have to have some long term plans uh, if that is done properly i believe we should be able to effectively reduce the numbers even though we may not be able to uh, stop uh, eradicate it completely all right when it comes to curing the disease do you think sri lanka as is in uh, power with international nations to treat dengue as a disease in terms of resources and staff wise uh, in fact uh, i would say sri lanka is uh, better than most of the countries when it comes to the management of the illness uh, if not the best so we have achieved that level with lot of uh, uh, discussions understanding of the illness training of uh, health staff which we have done uh, including at this uh, hospital uh, and with that over the years uh, with uh, we have gained lot of experience and uh, with necessary changes in our guidelines and treatment protocols we have able to we have been able to reduce the mortal rate quite significantly in 2009 when the the bigger outbreaks started uh, we had 35000 cases in that year with 354 deaths so we had 1% people who were dying but now we have been able to reduce the death rate to less than 0.15% so from 1% we have reduced it to 0.15% which is a significant uh, reduction and uh, so compared to any world standard we are doing very well uh, but then the problem is when numbers are high then it becomes difficult because the um, boards are overcrowded hospitals are overcrowded the staff is limited and we have to do this with that in that context so it becomes difficult and uh, the monitoring of these patients are very important which become difficult with more numbers now at present uh, we have a lot of patients and uh, in fact we have some patients uh, we have to put two patients in one bed because we don't have enough space so it is same for several other hospitals a lot of patients are there in national hospital kalbo villa nigambu gampaha uh, so these pa- hospitals have a lot of patients at present so that is why it is important to reduce the number while we are treating these patients effectively do you think doctor the awareness of the disease or dengue or the prevention measures taken for this is not enough is it that why people are uh, being careless about this uh, well i must say it is not only the awareness we have been uh, the the um, health minister of health then as uh, individuals uh, we Uh, have been doing lot of uh, awareness programs i believe people know it what it is but then there has to be certain changes uh, to be made uh, certain practices should be made to be sort of inbuilt uh, for example removing of um, uh, things which can collect water now that has to be a normal usual practice of people which is not happening so that's why we have to address it how to do that in long term basis in short term yes people can inspect the premises or the phis and other teams can visit the premises or house and see what is there where water can get collected and remove those and or instruct the the people in the house to remove those places but then it has to be a habit of people so that is what is not there so we have to have some method of uh, consistency consistency and also then there are other things other policies certain policies which you have to make for example we know roof gutters is a common place where water can get collected especially with rains uh, then there has to be an alternative for roof gutters i know architects have come up with various uh, effective proposals but then government has to make a decision to adopt a policy on that 
So there are certain things which can, not certain, many things which can be done on long term reduction of uh, the numbers of this. Okay, doctor. Now coming to the treatments and the medicines used to treat dengue, um, would you advise people to go for uh, Sinhalese, normal Ayurvedic medicine or Western medicine? Which one is more effective? Uh, now, in uh, Sri Lanka, we practice, uh, many of us practice Ayurvedic treatment. Uh, so simple things like uh, taking Kottamalli uh, or uh, Bangwell Geta, these are, these are common remedies which we all use, I use them. So, uh, but when it comes to a certain stage of the illness, we need to monitor these patients regularly to see whether these people are getting complications and then if they get these complications, then we have to treat those complications accordingly. So in such instances, people have to be in the hospital to detect such complications and to treat. And also, there are a lot of myths regarding treatment of these illnesses. Some people, you know, the common things are like drinking this uh, papal leaves, papaya leaves. Then some people uh, use this boiled uh, uh, young jackfruit. Now these are not Ayurvedic treatment. Unfortunately, some people believe these are Ayurvedic traditional medicine, which is not so. These are just uh, come up to the, uh, has come up to people as various beliefs, not Ayurvedic treatment. That's so right. Th those things should not be used at all. Yeah, that that was another question which I wanted to ask. Like, from where do these myths come from, and how far are these accurate? Because people tend to follow this, and you know, yes. as especially when you said, I've heard the saying that you know, papal kolakanda, it's good for dengue. I don't know how far that's effective. Yeah, some of these are commercial also. Now, um, I have seen in papers they have put this apple juice is good for dengue. It's a total uh, myth. I mean, I'm sure that it's a sales promotion. And it is quite expensive also. <laughs> so we don't advise people to use apple juice yes. because it's not useful. Uh, so similarly, there are the myths which have come, I don't know how it has come to uh, these beliefs, but there are beliefs like that, unfortunately, which are not uh, true. Okay. The follow-up question for that doctor is now, People tend to use Ayurvedic medicine also, Singhala medicine per se. But then sometimes they feel, ah, okay, make a hurry and I should switch into Western medicine. Some people use both together at the same time. Is it advised to do so? Because um, I'm not aware about the chemical reaction. Is there a chemical reaction for this? Is it okay to use both of them at the same time? Uh, I don't think I can answer that because we haven't studied what is happening with, uh, with these things. But then the, I don't think there is any problem in using simple remedies which are used traditionally with Ayurvedic practice. But as I said, to treat complications, I believe at the moment uh, we have to use uh, uh, the, what is happening, the treatment we give in hospitals because that has been practiced and we have found that as effective. And we have prevented uh, many deaths by adopting that treatment. We have seen people Go up getting complications and we have treated those complications successfully. So it is important to get that treatment. And even, even Western medicine, certain Western medicine also can be harmful. So if you take Western medicine also, you have to know what you are taking. You have to ask your doctor what are these medicines and make sure that you are given safe medicine for dengue. So are there safe and unsafe medicines? Yes, of course. Now for example, for fever, we advise only to take paracetamol, not to take other things like now. We used to, sometimes we used to give things like diclofenac sodium or mefenamic acid, uh, ibuprofen for fever and aches and pains. Aches and pains are quite common in dengue. So those are not good for dengue. So the medicines which can be taken in other instances can be bad in dengue. So therefore you have to ask your doctor, what are these medicines? And similarly, the steroids like prednisolone, dexamethasone, those are not good for dengue. Those can cause complications. So it is important for you to ask from your doctor. You have the right to ask from your doctor what medicines are they? Are they containing these steroids or, or the, this diclofenac group uh, medicines which can be harmful in dengue? Okay, thank you doctor. Now, there's a lot more to discuss, but before that we'll cut off into a small commercial break. You're watching Gen XYZ and we'll be back soon.
welcome back to Gen XYZ and we were in discussion with Dr. Ananda Vijay Vikrama, the senior consultant and physician of the National Institute of Infectious Diseases. Thank you, Doctor. Now, w before we left off near the break, we were talking about the use of Singhala Ayurvedic medicine along with Western medicine and about the myths that are created here in Sri Lanka. Um, now, this disease dengue, does it ever cause a lasting effects like for example th this is another myth uh, where I've heard they say like if women are affected with dengue it's going to affect their reproductive cycle and the rate of conceiving a child will decrease like I know that it's a myth but uh, how far is this true and does it cause lasting effects no no definitely not uh, the dengue illness generally lasts for about a week Sometimes, if you get complications, which are serious complications, then the disease, the disease can get prolonged more than a week. But otherwise, it's generally, it lasts for about a week. Then after that, maybe you are not, you have to still have some physical rest for another week or so. But then after that, you are completely all right. So it doesn't affect you in the long run. Mm -hmm. uh, now, there are many people, young people who do sports, competitive sports. So we advise them to get involved in that after a couple of weeks. Not a couple of months, but after a couple of weeks. Uh, so similarly, to answer your question directly, there's no evidence to say this uh, it affects the, uh, the reproductive uh, uh, cycles of females, uh, nothing. That's all not right. true And all. another yeah. important uh, point that you mentioned, Doctor, is about uh, the doing sports and heavy activities while you're inf uh, infected with the disease. Uh, people say that, you know, when you're infected with the disease, you're not supposed to do anything hard. You're supposed to rest completely. And even after getting the disease and you're cured, people advise, no, don't do any heavy activities. You might be prone to getting it again. So is that true? When you have the illness, yes, you have to have complete physical rest. It is a must. Otherwise, if you exert during the illness, then your complications can be more and severe. Mm -hmm. uh, however, after you get cured, after you, uh, you recover from the illness, that is generally, as I said, after a week, then we advise people generally to avoid physical exertion for about another, ma another week or so. If you have got serious complications, this week can be more than that. Uh, but then otherwise, uh, after that, you can start your normal work. So even people who uh, do competitive sports, we advise them to start training unless you have some serious complications after about two weeks uh, uh, after the illness to start their training. Okay. The next question is about the donor status. Now people who are donating blood or platelets per se, uh, is there something that they need to keep in mind? Is it advice for people who already had dengue to donate blood? Is there any effect on that? No, there's no effect because when the vi when il illness is cured, you don't have the virus any longer in your body. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can donate blood. There's no effect on that to, to you or to your donor after that. And also, uh, in your previous question, you uh, may ask whether the, you can get the illness again if you exert physically. No, it's not so. Gen generally, when you get the illness, you become immune to dengue. There are four types of dengue. You become immune to all four types, generally for about nine, ten months. It can be a yes, couple of months less in some people, months more in some people, but generally it's about for about eight, nine months you are immune. Uh, so it is unlikely to get it again very soon. But later, yes, you can get another, uh, get infected with another type. Right? Okay. Uh, but not immediately. So even if you exert after the illness, uh, once you recover, uh, it doesn't affect, it will not cause a reinfection. Okay. Is it imminent that a person who has got infected with dengue for the first time will definitely get it for the second time? No. It all depends on how you get exposed and whether you get uh, exposed to an infected mosquito okay. so told. And, and also the immunity you have. Okay. Doctor, you also said that there are four types of dengue. Is it four types or four stages of dengue? And what are the... Four types of dengue. Mm -hmm. we, we call it serotype. Serotype 1, mm -hmm. 2, 3, 4. So there are four serotypes identified. And uh, you can get infected with all four serotypes. So in other, why, other words, you can get dengue four times during your life. Right. right. Not okay. that everybody gets that, <laughs> but that can happen. Okay. So those four types, so we'll say 
uh, I got type 1. So the next time I get, I would be getting type 2, is it? Uh, depending on what is in the circulation, in the community. Okay, right. So what is the difference, doctor, between the four types? This, those are genetical differences, differences in, the, in their DNAs. Okay, got it. So now when it comes to the treatment process, doctor, you've been treating so many patients and I've got so many comments about you. Also, people have been coming and telling me, yes, Dr. Ananda is the best doctor. If you're getting dengue, please go talk to him. And I've heard a lot of stories also, doctor, about how you have been changing people's lives and saving people's lives as well. So since you have experience in that, uh, what can you tell about the development of the technology or the treatments available in uh, Sri Lanka compared to the previous years? Uh, yeah, first I must say it is not me who is treating these patients. We have a team. It, it, it's a team activity uh, which comprises of uh, the consultants, the junior doctors, the nurses, the other minor staff of the hospital. So it's a, it's a teamwork. Uh, so in our hospital we have a good team, so that's the secret of uh, our success. Uh, and then uh, regarding the treatment uh, and the development of that, uh, it's not very costly unless, the com unless you get severe complications with dengue. Uh, so the necessary equipments are available, necessary things are available and also those are not high cost things. The Probably the highest cost equipment which, are, which is necessary is ultrasound uh, uh, machine. Uh, which of course we can use for years, so the investment for that is quite worth uh, doing. Uh, and we, we have, and also a lot of uh, hospitals now have these equipments, so in many places this can be managed successfully. And uh, we have uh, trained a lot of health staff, so now the management in Sri Lanka has improved quite a lot. Has the methods of treating dengue uh, changed throughout the years? Yes. Now, though, earlier, 15 years ago, we, we used to give transfuse platelets to people when the platelet count goes down. Because those days, we believe uh, the problems in dengue is due to low platelet count. But now we know it is not so. So, we don't give platelets imp uh, as a sort of precaution. Hmm? Now, sometimes platelet can ca count can go down even to f 5. Yes. Right? From the, it's normal, it should has to be above 150, so sometimes it can go even to 5. But uh, we still, we don't give platelet, because the problems are not due to that. Problems are due to differences, so we address the, those problems. We have understood those uh, problems over the years, and now we treat accordingly. Right, so the treatments have been developing over the years. Definitely. now. Yes. Coming back to the disease, has the disease of dengue evolved throughout the years? Has the severity of it increased? Uh, severity of the illness, uh, shall I put it like this? Now, generally, when you get dengue for the first time, uh, it doesn't cause complications generally. It's uncommon to have complications with your first attack. But if you get it again, then the chances of getting complications are higher. Now, in our country, a lot of people have got the illness for the first time. So, when they get it again, then the chances of getting complications are high. So, that's why we see more people with complications. Uh, so, more than, say, if you consider the time, uh, compare the time 10 years back and now, we see more patients with complications because of that reason. Right. So, for example, if we take COVID-19, there have been so many evolutions of COVID-19. There have been so many variants also. Just like that, does dengue also have uh, different uh, variants? Because this viral infection, there can be little variations, but those are not as uh, prominent as in COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, in COVID, it's, uh, you easily get a new sort of type. Still, it's a COVID virus, but you get a com fairly different type. Uh, it doesn't happen. It has not happened in dengue yet. Right, okay. So, doctor, for the four stages of dengue, four types of dengue, are the treatments also different? No, the same. It's the ba same. Basically, it's like this. Now, the, if you get dengue, uh, you produce immunity against the virus and you get rid of the virus. And that's a natural process in the body. Some people get certain complications. So, what we do is we look for these complications, detect those early, and then treat those complications. So otherwise, you uh, get well on your own. Whether you get any treatment or not, you get your, um, well on your own. You get rid of the virus. 
Okay. But if you get complications, especially if the complications are severe, then we need to treat you. Otherwise, uh, the complications can become uh, severe and it can lead to serious illness. Okay. Uh, before getting the disease, I'm definitely precaution is better than cure. So, what are the prevention methods that nations have taken as a whole in order to prevent this from happening. For example, scientists have come up with methods to, you know, breed mosquitoes in a certain way that uh, mosquitoes won't be able to reproduce again. So, how far have we come in the world? What stage are we at the moment? Uh, basically, the most effective method adopted uh, worldwide is the removal of bre breeding places. As I said, the common breeding places are the places where water can get collected. Usually, these are, this happens in discarded items like plastic cups and uh, that, that sort of things, mm -hmm. yogurt cups, that sort of things. Uh, and then the roof gutters, then uh, there can be other things where water can get collected inside the house as well as outside the house. We have found uh, the, the, our entomology uh, people have found mosquitoes breeding in things like the trace of your uh, refrigerator and then in the air conditioner, so in such places because water gets collected and then uh, the mosquito can breed there. So such places have, uh, can lead to the spread of this. So basically looking for those places, removal of those places is the most important thing. Then at other times, when the, if the disease is spreading rapidly, if you get a lot of patients with dengue, that means there are a lot of mosquitoes with dengue virus in the environment. Area. So in such instances, we use fogging, the chemical method of killing the adult mosquito. It is not the recommended method to do all the time. But when the mosquito, uh, the number of mosquitoes are supposed to be quite high, then that's something which which is being used. Why because is it not, it, it's not recommended to do all the time because of the smoke? Uh, no, it can have, it can kill other uh, insects and uh, butterf right. okay. things like butterflies in the, in the environment. So it's not an environmental friendly okay. method. So that's why we don't recommend it to do every time or throughout the year. But when the mosquito numbers are quite high, that's the method we have to, we are forced to use. Okay. Coming back to the patient's severity levels, why is it different? Like some people might de get dengue in a much more severe level than another person. Why is it the case? Is it because of the level of immunity? That still we don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing we know is if it is the first time, then the chances of getting complications are less. If the second time is high. So that that is one reason. Then there are certain other people who are more prone to develop complications, like people who are obese are more likely to develop complications. People have diabetes more likely to develop complications. The pregnant mothers are more likely to develop complications. So there are certain categories which can we, which we have identified as uh, categories which can develop complications more compared to other people, but uh, the exact reasons are not known. Okay. Uh, another question doctor is now I've encountered with so many people and friends of mine also who have got the disease for the first time or the second time or sometimes the third and when they share their experience of going through the treatments and what they had to go through in terms of you know the curing methods they say that was one of the worst time periods that they have faced in their lives and they say please do not get dengue and they advise people also please be careful from not getting dengue so uh, what advice can you give to the young people or the people who are watching this in order to prevent themselves from getting dengue and what they should expect if they get dengue, this is what they need to go through? Uh, well, uh, not to get to, to not to get dengue is, you, de you, you have to, uh, <laughs> you want to make sure that you are not exposed to yeah. infected mosquitoes, which can be difficult. Mm -hmm. So there are various ways of, in addition to removing mosquito breeding places in your environment, uh, applying these mosquito repellents, using nets and that sort of things uh, can be used. But those are not 100% effective. Uh, so, uh, but you, you should use those such methods. So you reduce the chances of getting the infection, but you, can, you cannot totally eliminate it. Uh, if you get the illness, the common symptoms in dengue are severe headache, uh, you get a lot of aches and pains of the body, 
these are quite common and a lot of people have nausea so you can't eat and uh, occasionally you can have uh, sore throat, uh, loose motions, such symptoms also. So symptoms can be uh, sort of disabling. Uh, but generally these symptoms last for about 5-6 days maximum, uh, then after that you are alright. So it's, this is a very, uh, very short lasting illness in fact. Okay, what can they expect doctor when they get admitted to hospital, what, do sh what should they expect? Uh, in the hospital what we do is uh, when they get admitted, we basically look for the development of complications mm -hmm. by checking their for example, checking their heart rate, their blood pressure, then we do some blood testing and then from time to time we do uh, ultrasound scans of the tummy and then we monitor how much urine they pass, how much they drink. So these are the ways uh, and means of finding out whether they are developing any complications. So if you develop any complications, then we give, uh, uh, we decide on where, how much uh, fluid should be given as saline or otherwise we use certain other types of uh, salines and then sometimes we have to give blood. So it depends on what sort of complications you have. What is the time period doctor that a patient would be admitted in hospital, the time period? Generally it's about 3-4 uh, days, mm -hmm. so it's not a long period. 3-4 days? Uh, so yes, unless you have serious days, complications. Right, so in 3-4 days dengue can be treated. Uh, I, as I said, the whole illness lasts for about a week. So okay. generally, people tend to people need admission around the third or fourth day, and by seventh day you'll be all right unless you get severe complications. But unfortunately, what we see sometimes, people come late with complications, and then it becomes uh, difficult to treat, and also then they will have to be in the hospital longer time or a longer period, and they might need to be admitted to ICU. So that sort of problems are there. How soon, doctor, should a person um, consult a specialist if they get uh, symptoms? What we advise people is if you have fever, uh, this days it can be dengue. So at the end of 48 hours of developing fever, do a full blood count. And with that, go to a uh, hospital, government hospital, and uh, then you will be given advice. if. Uh, maybe to repeat the blood full blood count next day or maybe to get admitted and then what sort of treatment you need those advices will be given. Okay, thank you doctor. We'll continue this discussion but before that we are going into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon. You're watching Gen XYZ. Welcome back to Gen XYZ and we've reached uh, the last segment of this episode and we were in discussion with Dr. Ananda Vijay Vikram, the Senior Consultant Physician of the National Institute of Infectious Diseases. Uh, doctor, we left off last time, I remember you telling the prevention methods. Uh, you were talking about the method of fogging and also you were mentioning about uh, repellents. Now there are various types of repellents, doctor. there are cream based repellents, oil based repellents. Um, the most common method is, I think, in Sri Lanka is the citronella oil. So, but um, do you think these methods of repellents are safe for our skin? Because uh, most of them tend to lead to skin diseases or melanoma per se. So, is it recommended to use repellents all the time? Um, well, using repellents uh, can be useful uh, to a certain extent. Uh, because most of these repellents have some action, but the action lasts for a couple of hours, maybe one hour, maybe two hours, so it depends on the repellent and also depends on where you apply and where, which sort of environment you are in. Uh, you need to apply this, if you are applying, when you are likely to be bitten by a mosquito. There is generally, we know the mosquito, these mosquitoes bite people during the, the morning period and the evening period, mostly. So it is, that is the more, more likely period, but that doesn't mean that other times it cannot happen. So you don't have to have it throughout the day. Uh, but having said that, I must say the, the effects last for, for a short limited period. So therefore, even if you apply this, the, the protection you get is temporary. 
so as long as you don't uh, apply it daily throughout the day, I, I don't think there can be serious harmful effects. But some people can get allergic to some of these uh, repellents. Uh, so that sort of uh, problems can happen. Because uh, like most school children are advised to wear a repellent and come to school. Uh, so throughout the day they will be probably wearing the repellent. Yes. So yeah. Parents are cautious uh, about this. Yes, but applying the repellent throughout the day, applying once, uh, when you apply it once, it won't last uh, for till the, till the end of the day. So it's not going to be effective in that sense. Mm -hmm. So at the initial uh, couple of hours, two, three hours, there will be an effect, but not after that. Do you think uh, the traditional citronella oil is better than using any other form of repellent? Uh, I cannot answer that question because I don't think there are head-to-head -head comparison done using these uh, preparations. Okay, doctor. Now, uh, when it comes to the statistics, doctor, you told that year by year you have a number of cases which have been increasing too and the rates have been constantly increasing. So, do you have hard and fast facts to show that this is the case? Uh, actually, the the number of this number of cases have, have not been increasing every year. Mm -hmm. uh, it had been in some years it had been relatively less. Now, for example, as, uh, as I said earlier, we started seeing this high number of cases in two thousand and nine. Uh, before that, we had four five thousand cases occurring every year. But in two thousand and nine, we had a large outbreak of thirty five thousand cases. And since then, we have been having quite a high number of patients, more than 25,000 patients per year. Uh, and in 2017, we had the highest number with 186,000. And uh, if you come think about uh, the last year uh, uh, and uh, the year before, the year before the numbers were uh, not very high. Mm -hmm. uh, if you see this graph, you can see this shows the dengue situation. Uh, now this year we have got this up to day before yesterday. We have got 41,104 cases throughout the country out of which 20,000 cases are in the western province. Uh, so almost half of patients are in the, in the western province. Here you can see. And if you analyze the western province, you see most of the patients were from Colombo district and the Gampa district, uh, just about around 43% and this uh, other part is from Kalutara. So mostly from Colombo and uh, Gampa district and half of the whole country patient load is from western province. And this graph shows the numbers in the western province. Now this blue line shows the number of cases in 2021. And you can see there was a little peak in the mid-year, mid which we generally expect with monsoon, and there's a higher peak towards the end of the year, again with monsoons. This is the last year, the green line started with a high peak, and then we had the peak in the mid-year. And this is, these are the numbers this year. You can see it had started high and it had remained high. And now we are reaching the monsoon period, so it is likely to exceed the peak of the previous year. So we have to anticipate uh, quite a high number of cases. In fact, having this, the purpose of having this data is now by end of March, we knew we are going to have higher number of cases. So having the purpose of, purpose of having this data is to take preemptive, preemptive measures to the, the cut down and reduce the spread of the illness. So the data has to be used uh, productively, proactively, uh, for these purposes so that we can control these infections. And as we look at the graphs also, Doctor, the curves have been increasing throughout the years as well. Has it been the case throughout the years? Uh, uh, no, actually the, the case numbers uh, uh, high, as I said, the highest in uh, 2017 and then in 2018 again we had a large number of cases but less than 2017 and 2019 also. But in uh, 2020 and 2021, the numbers are relatively less. That doesn't mean we, we had a lot of cases, but the numbers are relatively less. And this year is going to exceed both those years. Okay. Uh, doctor, another thing that uh, I've heard people say is uh, mosquitoes have a pre uh, preference for blood taste. Like, oh, I give lay rasa hindatama, mosquitoes are coming and biting you. Is, is there a certain uh, 
means like that because pe or a certain blood type that people get infected more. Uh, no, no, there's nothing uh, like that. What we see is now this mosquito actually does not get satisfied by taking blood from one person. So it sucks blood from one person and goes to another one and then such. So generally we see a couple of several people in the family gets affected uh, by this and people get fall ill at the same time. Uh, and, uh, and if the mosquito is infected with the virus, uh, there's a high chance that you get the infection. Doctor, according to your experience, uh, what was the worst case that you have experienced so far? If you could share some uh, stories. Um, well, I must say there are some good uh, sort of uh, uh, happy experience in managing uh, or uh, curing seriously ill patients and also unhappy experience of uh, uh, not able to save some patients. I think if I may uh, uh, mention the, probably the worst experience I had was uh, I remember one day a child was brought uh, with very low blood pressure uh, with uh, serious complications in dengue. Uh, the child blood was given for a test in the previous night and the father had collected the report, didn't realize that it is a problem and went to work and when he came back he saw that the child was not well and then brought to the hospital, but it was too late. Within three hours, the child died. That is really and then, unfortunate. Uh, I know there's another patient, a young uh, boy of 19 years, uh, was, has taken uh, some diclofenac sodium for the aches and pains with the fever. And then the parents went, went to work. He was studying for his exams. And then when they came back in the afternoon, they found the patient was, uh, the child was collapsed, the son was collapsed at home and he was admitted to hospital. I also was called to see the patient, but uh, that boy died. So there are some bad experience like that. At the same time, we were able to, in the hospital, we were able to save some very critically ill patients, that is with the help of our team. So those are good, happy experience, but still, uh, a lot of problems can be avoided if you get medical advice timely, get admitted timely and also avoid these unnecessary drugs uh, which can be harmful in dengue. Yes, and doctor we are reaching the end of our program also. Before we end off, um, I mean it's very unfortunate me hearing all these stories also and it's very important for people to be precautious of getting not just dengue but any other disease per se. So when we take the age group, which age group has been affected the most with dengue and also something doctor that you mentioned while we are walking down the wards also, children have been affected with dengue and they are they were unable to attain their exams or levels. O levels are going on these days and the IDH has provided the facility of doing the exams in the hospital also. So if you can share details on that briefly. Uh, yeah, now the dengue illness was considered as uh, illness of children many years ago. Uh, but then it has changed. Now more and more adults are getting affected. In fact, more than 75% of patients are above 15 years of age. But out of that, mostly are young adults. Adults between the age of 15 to 30, most of the young adults, most of them are young adults. And as you mentioned, uh, many children got affected with this illness last couple of weeks. And uh, this has been happening over the years. So for the last several years, we, uh, with the uh, support from the Department of Examination, were able to conduct the O-level examination in our hospital. So this time most of which we did. In fact, I must say the Department of Examination was uh, extremely helpful in this. Otherwise, of course, we can't have it. Uh, and um, our staff also was uh, very helpful in this. So many children uh, did the exam in the, while in the hospital, while getting treatment. And uh, I hope they did well. That's amazing to hear, Doctor. And you mentioned that mostly the young people are being affected by dengue, especially. And it's basically because of the immunity levels, I presume, that happens, right? Uh, yes, probably. We, we think so because the older people may be more immune to it after having a previous infection. That may be the reason. 
but what we practically see is a lot of young people get affected. Okay, thank you so much, Doctor, for sharing your ideas with us. And I'm glad to hear that, you know, the IDH Hospital has collaborated with the authorities and providing the facility of children affected with dengue to do their examinations in the, in the hospital bed itself. So thank you for taking these initiatives as well. And thank you for sharing your ideas on our program today. Thank you, welcome. And that was our episode on Gen XYZ. Always remember, be precautious and prevent yourself from getting any sort of disease. It doesn't have to be dengue per se, but from anything. So uh, just in case you couldn't watch us on air, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And we will be back again next week with another topic or issue based on the youth. I'm Suzanne Shanali. Stay safe and have a good night.